we are the heart of England Forest. So we're an environmental charity um, with, with the main aim of creating a 30,000 acre forest in the heart of England. So geographically speaking, uh, we are based within Warwickshire, but we've also got bits of land um, in Worcestershire uh, as well. Um, so our pockets of land sort of roughly go from sort of South Birmingham and Redditch direction down to Stratford-upon-Avon and then across to Evesham as well. Um, so us as a charity, uh, we were set up in 2003 by a gentleman called Felix Dennis. Now he was a businessman, a publisher, a poet, an entrepreneur, but also he just really, really loved trees. And so what he did in 2003 was he set up the charity with our grand aim of this 30,000 acre forest because he wanted to have sort of a, a lasting positive impact on where he lived at, uh, in Dorsington near Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, so yes, yeah, so he set up the charity in 2003. And then from there in 2013, we planted our one millionth tree, which was our first grand milestone. And then here we are in 2022, and a couple of weeks ago, we planted our two millionth tree, which was hugely exciting for us. Um, and also where we're currently sat now is we uh, have got 7,000 acres of land and four and a half thousand acres of that is woodland, uh, sort of semi ancient woodland, but also uh, newly planted as well. We know that woodland is fantastic for biodiversity, for tackling climate change, but also for people. And so as a charity, what we try to do is to create a very uh, biodiverse, rich space for wildlife, but also we want to connect people with nature. And we, with the work that we do, we try, we try and do that. So woodlands are fantastic, as I've just said, but we recognize that to have a truly sort of strong environment, we want a range of habitats, right? And so that's what we do across our land. We have what we like to call a mosaic of habitats. So obviously got the woodland there, but we've also got wetlands and grasslands and meadows and streams and rivers and lakes and all those sorts of things. Because we believe that to have, as I say, a really strong environment, you've got to be able to have a home for a whole host of wildlife across a whole host of habitats. So that's broadly speaking, that is our work, but um, there's a lot of manpower that goes in behind that to make it all happen. So obviously we've got our forestry team and biodiversity team that are very sort of practical uh, on the ground um, doing that sort of work. We've also got our learning and skills team who provide um, educational sessions in the outdoors. We have got um, our a lot of engagement going on so we've got various corporate partnerships community partnerships um, and events going on we've also got lots of admin staff and finance and communications but underpinning all of that we've got a literal army of volunteers that help support across the charity and who are really really valuable asset to us um, so that is a bit about us but just one other thing, if you are interested in a career in the environmental sector, then I would recommend you follow us on social media and you keep an eye on our career site. Also, if you want, if you are more interested to find out more about the charity and the work that we do, to, to visit our website um, and to possibly sign up to our free e-newsletter and things like that. But that's all from me. You're, you're here to listen to our speakers to find out how they got their jobs here in the environmental sector. So without further ado, um, I'm going to pass over to Yolanda, who's going to tell us a little bit more about her background. Uh, great, yeah. So as Alicia said, I'm Yolanda and I'm one of the assistant forest rangers here at the heart of England Forest. Um, so today I'll be speaking to you guys a little bit about my job and how I got into the role. Um, and also just give you some top tips about how to get into a similar role and things that I found really useful. Um, so yeah, I started in the charity in March 2021 and I started as a forestry intern. So I did the internship at the charity. Um, and prior to that, I had kind of minimal experience in the sector. Um, so I did an undergraduate degree in English and creative writing. Um, and then once I graduated I, I kind of moved into the world of work um, and did a few different things so I kind of started off working for an expedition company and expedition operations um, and then I moved into charity fundraising um, I then kind of realized I wanted to get into a more practical role um, practical conservation role but just 
didn't know where to start because my degree wasn't really relevant. Um, so what I decided to do was to try and find a charity that I could fundraise for that was more in line of where I wanted to move. So I started fundraising for a tree planting charity called Tree Aid, and they plant trees in Africa. Um, so it wasn't the kind of practical conservation role I wanted, but it, in my mind, was a nice step to show to future employers that I was really passionate about forest reestablishment. Um, and I thought that was a, a nice way to kind of segue into into the kind of practical conservation role that I eventually hope to get. What I kind of did um, to get the baseline kind of experience needed for my internship um, is I started volunteering for um, a wildlife charity called the Alson Arda River Trust. Um, so kind of things I did with them included tree planting, um, erosion control, uh, river clearance and, and things like that. Um, and then I also kind of think that I, my enthusiasm and my motivation really helped with get me, getting me that internship. Um, because I just think it really showed to, to kind of employers and in my interview that I was really passionate about um, practical conservation. Um, and I kind of demonstrated that enthusiasm through volunteering. Um, it just showed that I was willing to give my time up to go and actually do this thing that I was really passionate about and, and show that I was really committed. Um, and I kind of also showed that enthusiasm by researching and reading up on a, a lot of kind of various topics to do with the role. So um, kind of forestry in general um, and wildlife conservation um, and things like that. Um, and I just found doing that research and that reading really helped as well because it meant I had something to talk to it to employers about in interviews and you know maybe kind of drop a few bits of information in that I was already aware of that could show to them like oh you know well this person is isn't interested and already knows a little bit about the kind of sector um and and yeah just kind of showed again that that enthusiasm and that motivation I got the internship um and then as I developed on the internship I then got the skills and experience needed to become an assistant ranger so I found my internship was a really great way to get to the role I am now because it meant I was trained up on a lot of the the kind of tickets which is essentially the training needed to be an assistant ranger so that's things like chainsawing um tractor driving and, and things like that none of which I had any experience in before my internship and so yeah the internship was a great way to get those skills and experiences needed to then develop as an assistant ranger and, and eventually secure that permanent position so yeah um i would say if you are interested in an internship to kind of potentially move into a similar role definitely look at the training that's provided as part of that internship because usually the baseline kind of tickets needed to be an assistant ranger would include tractor driving and chainsaw tickets um, so if you can find an internship out there that actually provides those then that's fantastic because you you know you're halfway there you've already got you've got those tickets and that's kind of a, a general requirement for all assistant ranger jobs um, so it's definitely worth looking at what internships and what training is offered as part of those internships so this slide is just a bit about the job in general. Um, so it is a very physical and a very practical job. Um, lots of being outside. And in fact, every day I'm outside doing something or other. I just wanted to point out as well, it's not commercial forestry that I do. So there is a side of forestry that's more kind of production based. So that would be growing and felling trees for production um, for timber and things like that. My role as a forester is a lot more conservation based. So it will be planting trees to establish new woodland and that will be woodland for wildlife. Um, and then also just managing existing woodland to kind of help the biodiversity and help the wildlife thrive in those woodlands. And yeah, it's a very, very varied job. So tasks can change, uh, you know, day to day um, as can priorities. So for an example, you might be tree planting in the winter, but a storm comes through and knocks down a dangerous tree and you have to go and fell that tree and deal with that dangerous tree there. And then so, yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite exciting. because Things do change quite dramatically and quite quickly. And it means that you're doing lots of different things, which is something I really enjoy. So then, yeah, to go into more depth about the job through a kind of seasonal lens, because it is very seasonal in the work that we do. 
Um, so winter is predominantly tree planting. So that runs from kind of November to March time. So that will be just tree planting day in, day out. And that job itself requires bashing in stakes, planting trees, and then tubing them with big kind of plastic tubes just to protect them from deer browsing and other kind of animal browsing. It's just worth pointing out, though, that that's not a kind of standard for an assistant ranger, a, a kind of across the sector. Most kind of rangers will do some tree planting, but as Heart of England Forest is a tree planting charity, we do a really long tree planting season. So just kind of wanted to make the point that if you're maybe not that keen on planting for kind of half the year, don't be disheartened if you would be interested in an assistant ranger role because you don't necessarily have to do such a long tree planting season. That is very specific to our charity, um, but there will be other organisations out there that do maybe a little bit less. So yeah, that, that's just something I wanted to point out. But I mean, I love tree planting, so I, you know, I'm more than happy to do it for, for kind of half the year. So yeah, as... The tree planting season comes to an end that's when we might start doing some more kind of tree work um so that would be things like coppicing or tree felling and pollarding and pruning and we do that in the winter just when the trees are dormant to try and kind of minimize the injury to tree so yeah we do that then um and then we start in the kind of spring and summer to do other jobs all sorts of jobs around the forest so we'll do maintenance tasks which could be things like fencing or gate hanging mowing biodiversity surveys um pathway checks um strimming weed management doing deer impact assessments so the summer is really nice and varied which kind of balances out that long tree planting season so you know you're doing things different every day which is great and really love that and then in autumn we'll start to round off any summer jobs and we'll start to carry out loss assessments on existing planted fields um, that's just essentially going around and checking the survival rate of trees because it might be that in the coming planting season we'll need to replace them um, if the loss is higher than we would like it to be um, so we start doing that then and also it means in the autumn we can start doing cutting back some hedges where there might be maybe public footpaths and things that's something we can't do in the summer unfortunately just because of bird nesting season and we don't want to disturb any of the birds in the hedgerows so yeah, we can do all of that in autumn and then it takes us back around to tree planting. Just one thing I wanted to point out as well is the job may also require some people engagement skills. Um, so you might be asked to run some guided walks. You might also just bump into people around the forest. So it's just worth pointing out that even though it's not a people engagement role in itself, there is an element of that. So yeah, just be mindful that you, you, know, you might need to draw on those skills as well. So these are just some photos that I've added to add a bit of a visual element. Um, so we've got me chainsawing um, and then the middle photo is guard removal. So that's just going around taking guards off trees um, or if they need to stay on a bit longer but might be a bit wonky, we might go around and fix them and replace broken stakes or broken uh, tubes. And then the last photo is me there just tree planting. And the next slide, I've just got a few more photos. So that's just a bit of fencing I've put in. The middle photo is a coppice stool, so that's coppiced hazel, um, just to give an example of what coppicing is. So just it's taking, um, essentially just taking kind of trees, usually things like hazel, right down to the kind of stool, um, and that will encourage new growth and very straight growth so that then they can be coppiced in kind of seven years later um, and they can be used for things like bean poles or building with and things like that. And then the last photo is, yeah, just hedge cutting. So that's just an example of what we might do to clear a pathway and um, to make it more accessible for the public. Just why I love the job. Um, I think there's massive benefits to, to the job I do. Firstly, I would say one of the really cool things is you get to use some really cool machinery. Um, so I get to use chainsaws, I learned to ride, ride tractors, um, ride on mowers, and you also learn how to fix and maintain that equipment too. I had no skills kind of in that area prior to doing my internship, and now I feel really competent at, you know, fixing chainsaws, diagnosing problems with them, um, and that's just something I really love. It's really practical, and, and yeah, it's just quite cool to use a chainsaw as well. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I also enjoy that there's so much variety in the job as well. Yeah, I think I previously mentioned kind of week to week things change. So that's really fun. And I think also you have a real sense of knowing that the 
physical work you're doing and the practical work you're doing is having a positive impact on the environment. I just love knowing that the work I do kind of helps combat environmental degradation. Um, so I'm very, you know, I'm really passionate about that. And it's just nice knowing that I'm making a small difference every day. It's also really team based is something I really enjoy. Um, it just makes it a lot of fun at work. But it's worth pointing out that sometimes you may need to be kind of lone working as well. Um, for example, in the summer, you might be mowing kind of day in, day out for a couple of weeks. And that will be you just in a, a kind of tractor cab mowing big fields. Um, so now and again, there is kind of a chance to do some loan working. And then just not to find other negatives, but, um, you know, as with any job, there kind of are downsides. Um, so I would say for me, the downsides are poor weather and being exhausted. So, you know, you, you will be out in the kind of cold and the wet and the winter. So just be mindful of that if you're thinking about a job in, in kind of in the environmental sector. If you wanted to do a job like mine, you would be, have, you know, be willing to be outside in kind of all weathers. But it's, it's really not as difficult as it sounds. And, you know, I think being in a team does make it really fun as well, because you can all kind of have a little moan together and, and then just get on with it. And, you know, the next day it will be sunny again. So it's absolutely fine. And then, yeah, the other side is just, it is quite physically demanding. So those days where you might be tired, you know, you're tree planting and, and you're feeling quite exhausted, you still have to persevere. Um, so that's maybe just like another slight downside to the job is that you are expected to be quite physical day in, day out. So this slide's just my kind of top tips, things that people told me when I was getting into the sector or things I wish I'd known when I was looking to get into, into this career. Um, so firstly, my top one is to volunteer. Um, I think this is probably one of the most useful pieces of advice I could give. Um, and I actually asked my team today kind of what advice they would give because they've had similar backgrounds and they all said volunteering as well. I just think, you know, it shows to employers that you're really keen and you're dedicated to the kind of sector. But I also think it's really beneficial just for you as well, because it means that you can try your hand at a few different things. And it might, you know, you might go to, along to a, a kind of wildlife volunteering session and it might be like pond dipping. And you think, I love pond dipping. I want to try and get a job specifically where I'm going to be doing things like pond dipping or wetland management or something like that. So it's just good for you to figure out exactly where you want to go with your career as well. Next thing I would say is just say yes to as many opportunities as you can. Join local wildlife groups, attend online events, which obviously you guys are all keen to do because you're here today. But yeah, there's so many opportunities out there, so many free talks online. Just try and get to as many of them as you can. Um, because I think you'll just you learn so much from that. The next is to research. So I kind of previously mentioned, um, just read up. You don't, you know, you don't have to spend hours and hours studying, but just some time now and again to read a rewilding book or, you know, a wildlife book. It really helps to have that kind of baseline knowledge. And it might kind of make you stand out from the crowd a bit in an interview where you can kind of draw on a few facts that you've learned and, you know, impress um, potential employers. And another thing I'd just say as well is it might be a good idea if you wanted to get into my role specifically to read up about things like wildlife legislation um, or kind of health and safety at work legislation. You don't have to study it really kind of intently and know exactly what all the legislation in that, those two areas are, but they're things that come up quite a lot in interviews, particularly maybe some questions about wildlife legislation or bird nesting season is quite a common interview question that comes up um so just having a little bit of an understanding about those kind of various legislations could really help as well and then yeah also so I just kind of want to end by saying um you know don't be disheartened um if you've been trying to kind of break into this sector for a while um, and you find you're not you don't really feel like you're getting anywhere just like don't give up because I think eventually you will find a way to get in whether it's an internship or however you might get into this field um, so I was 26 before I started my internship and you kind of think of an internship being for, for maybe a school leaver or someone like that but actually I was you know heading towards my late 20s and I still managed to kind of find my way in so yeah I just wanted to say that it, it, you know it's not too late to give up on finding your dream role and if you persevere with it you definitely will find something and yeah I just wanted to finish on this slide saying that I've spoken a lot about the internship but there are kind of other ways you can get into my role so if you are a school leaver or you're looking to do choose your kind of degree um, choices 
there are some degrees out there that could really help um, kind of get into the sector. So things like environmental sciences or forestry or countryside management, they're all really good starting points if you were wanting to go to university. Obviously, there's the internship. That's how I got into it. But you could also just do loads of volunteering experience and pay for those like training opportunities, like your chainsaw ticket yourself and kind of off your own back. And if you built up the experience that way, that is also another way you can get into it. So it's not a kind of direct route. You don't need to go get a degree and then move into it. There are kind of multiple different channels you can go down. So yeah, whatever you think would be best for you. And then very finally, I've just got a few resources here that I have used in the past and found really, really useful. So the first one is nationalcareers.service.gov.uk and it's just um, it's just the profile of what a countryside ranger does. Um, so it's essentially just a government web- website with a snapshot kind of page of what being a, an assistant ranger or a countryside ranger would do and there's a bit more info on there about things you can do to help you get that job the next is countrysidejobs.com and that's a really good useful website for volunteering and training opportunities so not only do they list jobs on there that you might potentially be interested in um, they've also got a fantastic volunteer volunteering kind of page where you can find loads of volunteering opportunities um, and various different training opportunities as well and then finally conservationcareers.com is really useful as well it's um, similar to countryside jobs it's got a lot of information about volunteering but they've also got a really useful downloadable pdf document that lists hundreds of internships both UK based and worldwide um, so if you can find that that uh, pdf on there then I'd really recommend having a look at it because it's got loads of stuff like marine biology internships or similar jobs to me just like so many internships on there um, and it's really really interesting to look at. Hello everyone so I'm uh, Sam I'm the biodiversity data and survey officer at the Heart of England Forest uh, so uh, as the title suggests, I deal with all of the biodiversity data and organising uh, the biodiversity surveys we do. So how I started off on the path um, towards this career is a childhood interest in animals. I always loved them, um, fell out uh, a bit of it maybe in my teen years, but then uh, when I was about 16 and thinking about uh, where I might want to go and do a degree, I realised actually uh, it is where I wanted to uh, carry on and uh, have a career in. At A-levels, uh, I did bio- biology, geography, and uh, I also did physics. Uh, but my results weren't great. I got D in both biology and physics and a B in geography. So with that D in biology, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm, that's it, I'm stuffed. But not the case. I ended up uh, uh, getting into university and went to the University of Gloucestershire and um, got a Bachelor's uh, of Science in Biology there. So if you're um, at that A-level stage and maybe a bit worried about your results, I'd say don't worry because it's only the first step and uh, uh, people will look past that and to other things you've done and yeah uh, not something to worry about too much. I'd say actually also more important than the education side of things uh, as Yolanda's already said having a degree helps um, especially if it's in a related subject but it's it's not essential. Uh, more important I'd say is actually the, um, the skills you build up along the way and uh, the so I've done that through practical volunteering so um, from 18 to 23, I did lots of uh, practical uh, habitat management for a local wildlife trust. Uh, so here's a picture of me doing that there for a few years back, uh, removing birch from a heathland um, to restore it back to heathland. It was previously planted up with conifers, as you can see in the background. But that wasn't just what I did with there. I, I did uh, coppicing work, um, fencing, um, bracken bashing um, back in a grassland to restore that. Uh, a huge number and range of things, um, seed collections in the wildflower meadow, uh, masses, uh, and that has built up all the skills that, and uh, knowledge um, outside of what I learned at university I've needed for my uh, role now. Then uh, also, which has been very important, is um, some voluntary surveys I did with a consultancy, uh, which I started when I was 18. Uh, this started off primarily bat surveys. Um, but as time went on, I ended up moving into to reptiles and doing some surveys there and newts as well. And also um, very good after about three years, I um, brought enough experience. I was able to get paid for it, which is uh, an extra. Um, so even on my progression to where I am now, um, permanently employed, I-, I was already sort of part time on the contractual basis then. Uh, and that's also given me the skills now where I very, very recently managed to get a bat license, which is uh, certainly very important if you want to go into maybe the more consultancy aspect uh, side of things. 
Um, but as well as this, I did other voluntary surveys. So um, these, both of these are both still ongoing. Uh, the Willow Tip survey, which is something uh, RSPB have ongoing. And that's for the Willow Tip, which is I think the second uh, most, the bird which has declined um, the most other than the turtle dove in the entire country. Um, and there are, there are squares for that up and down the country. Uh, so if, even if you're not local to where we are, um, there's plenty of places you can do that. Uh, and I also did what's called the Wetland Bird Survey uh, over in Stratford-upon-Avon nearby. And again, that's a one, uh, day, a, uh, one uh, day a month survey where you go out and um, survey all of the wetland birds on a, um, on a water course or uh, on a water body. And these are both things which you can really easily get into. Uh, and again, it's just more skills that you're building up, um, bird identification, and also showing that you're enthusiastic about doing this. It's, it's showing that this is what you want to do. As well as this, while I was at university, um, I volunteered at Shelton Science Festival. Um, I was probably a bit shy back then, and I sort of realised it and realised, all right, I need to get over that if I, uh, if I want to go and get into a career, because I'll probably end up having to do some people engagement stuff. So um, I, um, I volunteered on the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust stand for that um, over about three years. And so I was interacting with members of the public and uh, school groups, and that certainly certainly helped build up that um, that engagement with the, the public that I needed for my current role. Uh, and I also did some surveys um, for them, going around and asking people why they'd visited. Which, uh, if anyone's ever done that for the first time, you'll you'll know it's uh, pretty difficult. So once you get past that step of doing things, everything else feels like a double a doddle. And then the final thing I did while at university was I helped organise a bioblitz. And if you don't know what one of those are, um, it's a 24-hour, uh, 48-hour event where you record as many species in a space um, over that allotted time. And it means that um, you'll end up over that 24-hour, 48-hour period, uh, end up with two, three or 400 or more records uh, for different species in that area. So it's really, really important. And that built up uh, lots of organisational skills that I needed. Um, so I was sort of uh, asking people to come along and um, help to survey, um, organising things like where we're going to put the tents and whatnot on the day, the timetable. So that really got my uh, organisational skills up. And then I think compared to everyone else here, I ended up uh, being employed by the Heart of England Forest in a bit of a different way because um, I actually started off here as a volunteer um, as I live nearby. Um, I started volunteering one day a week um, on, a, on the practical volunteering side of things. So I was doing tree tree removal. Um, I did a couple of butterfly surveys at Coton Park, which is here uh, on the right. And uh, I also did some heather management at this site. And I did this while walking four days a week at McDonald's, where I worked until I was 23. So again, as uh, Yolanda was saying, if you feel like you're, you're getting a bit late, and I say it's a, that's very much sort of a first step career, it feels for many. Um, I say many people when they when hit 23 think, oh, why am I still here? But not a problem because uh, here I am <laughs> and then I, after that I shifted to doing completing two bird surveys um, for the heart of England forest uh, you can see one of my transects here which is at Coton Park and uh, I did another one at another site near Studley and after I did the breeding bird surveys on both of these sites I created a uh, bird territory map from um, the data I'd collected uh, using something called QGIS uh, GIS stands for geographical information system and if you haven't heard of it before, think of something like Google Earth or Google Maps, but you can edit it and it's about 100 times more useful. Um, QGIS is free. Uh, it's certainly something if you're interested in more, be maybe more of a, a computer based role to, to get into. It's got quite a steep learning curve at first, but once you get over that, it's, it's quite easy and, and very, very useful. And after doing that, um, I was contracted one day a week to collate all the existing biodiversity data uh, that the forest had and to um, do biodiversity related mapping after showing what I could do in QGIS. When I uh, started on that contract, uh, there was only one person in our biodiversity team. So it was trying to get all of those um, results in order, um, which we had over previous surveys, so then they could be used on, on habitat management plans and whatnot. And then after nine months of being a contractor, um, my current role became available. And uh, because of the skills I've mentioned, I did as a volunteer, did as a consultant uh, on bat surveys and whatnot, my stuff I'd done for Heart of England, I ended up getting the job and here I am. Uh, so about my job, so yes, as I've said, I organise and manage most of the uh, biodiversity surveys at the forest. Um, so this involves organising stuff with both forestry team, uh, my own team, and uh, a lot of it is done by volunteers. 
And organizing that, uh, so it's uh, very much a case of making sure I've got a plan, say in like February, March time, uh, then that get that out to the volunteers and keeping track of, of how they do that through the summer and then getting that back and collating all those results at the end of the year. I complete some surveys of my own uh, and help others with them. So it's not just all computer work. So for example, uh, we did some Purple Emperor surveys last year. Uh, you can see one on the right here. That was one of the surveys I did. And then as I've said, uh, lots of data collation and interpretation. So I've mentioned the collection bit, but then once we've got it in that spreadsheet, we need to interpret it. So um, I then go through, um, get it into to graphs and, and map it, of course, and that helps to guide how we manage our land. As I've also mentioned, uh, QGIS, I map anything biodiversity related, and I've mapped other things which people have needed as well um, across our teams. I'm currently organising the yearly bio blitz we do after doing it in previous years of course um, we had one last year we're doing one this year and then I did one at um, university and then I also do uh, plenty of stuff to do with other events so we're now doing volunteer days I help to um, run some of those we do training so we've had a butterfly training day recently I've organized that we've got some more coming up so it, it's quite a varied job as you can see it's not it's a very uh, nice mix of doing the um, collation of data on my computer and and getting all of that in order so we can then use that to influence and, and manage what we do in the forest for the benefit of wildlife, but then also actually going out uh, myself and um, surveying it or, or helping to do stuff myself. So here's an example of some of the things I've done, for example. So um, at the bottom in the middle, you, it might look like a, just a, a pile of mud, but uh, as I said, this is one of the, um, the practical things we did. We found us at this site, we had quite a few reptiles and this is a reptile hibernacular we created last year. Um, on the right is a, um, a bird box which I helped to install um, and now I've got some volunteers which are uh, actually bringing the birds in there so again it's that progression on um, and at the bottom left uh, that's um, a layout for one of our purple emperor surveys we were doing um, so again uh, organizing that and at the top left this is an example of a QGIS map so as you can see it, it shows where the dragonflies that's what it is in this case where where they um, where they are around this pond, how many are breeding, um, and then expand that across to the rest of the forest. And uh, it's, um, it's a very, very useful uh, tool. I think that about finishes my talk. Thank you, Alicia. Hello, everybody. So I'm Ellie, and I am the Gawker Education Officer. So I started with the charity in April 2021, um, and I was an intern for the Learning and Skills team. And luckily, I applied for the Gorka Education Officer role, and I was really lucky that I got the role. So I've been in that role since January. So my role with the Heart of England Forest, so I work with our learning and skills team, which delivers formal and informal learning programmes to schools. So essentially, it's not forest school, it's school in the forest. And we plan curriculum based sessions for each school. So they might say, can we have geography? Can we have English? And we will put together a session for them to do that in the forest. And it builds things like resilience and confidence with also getting that curriculum based knowledge that they need and personal outcomes. You know, it's good for kids that don't enjoy learning in the classroom and things like that. And um, so how I got the job. So I've always had an interest in nature and the environment from a young age. And I've also always really been interested in education. And originally, when I was at school, I always wanted to be a teacher. And when I was sort of picking to go to university, I was sort of do I want to do mainstream education? Do I want to do normal education? But then I thought, I love nature. You know, I think children are, are the future. They are, you know, you can do as much practical conservation as you like, but you need to teach the future generation about it and how to look after it. And I think that's the better way to do it. So I'm really interested in that. So I decided that I was going to go to uni and I studied um, animal behaviour and wildlife conservation three years which was really good it covers like ecology and all about different habitats and how you can survey for things um and then also I do like everyone else I've done a lot of volunteering so I've been a girl guide leader for six years and it's a role that I really love and I really relish and it's enabled me to gain new skills and knowledge especially working with children it gives you a lot of insight on how to sort of manage behaviours and work with children of different needs and abilities and how you need to sort of tailor learning sometimes for different groups. And I also worked for the RSPB. I was an engagement officer and I basically worked in Birmingham in the black country and I worked to engage families in their local green spaces and tried to encourage people to get out into their green space and explore what they wanted to do. And that was a real insight because I actually realised how many children 
don't know what like a, a woodlouse is or what a ladybird is. I've also worked in a prison. I worked in a young offenders for a year, a 12 to 18 year old. So I worked as an enrichment officer. And that again, taught me a lot of skills about how to deal with like behavior management and kids from different backgrounds, different demographics, things like that. Um, so about my job. So I work in a team of four. So our day to day is we plan and deliver our formal and informal education programs. So day to day, we will have schools in probably about four a week and we will be delivering our sessions, whether it be history, science, but it is all curriculum based. It's all very active. We try and have an active spin on it. So they might do a bit of like sitting and learning and a bit of sort of active learning. We also do things like bushcraft. So we might do like fire lighting, den building and all the fun aspects. So some of the pictures I've got on the screen are actually some of the things that we do. So we've got like some broomsticks and kids made at a summer club that we have. Um, we have some dens that they make. They really enjoy den making. And my favourite comment from a child so far ever has been when we've been in a wood full of sticks. Where do I get the sticks for my den? That was a personal highlight for me. Um, we also do a lot of informal learning. So we have like our young foresters and our mini foresters, which looks to engage families and young people that are looking to volunteer in the forest and get into the forest with their families. And they do practical tasks, and bushcraft, and they learn about conservation and bird spotting and things like that. Lots of different things. Um, so my internship in terms of my role now was quite similar. You know, I was doing quite a bit of plan planning and delivery. Um, my new role, which is at our new site in Gorkut, is it's a 62 acres, not acre, sorry, 62 hectares site, and it, um, no, acre woodland, sorry, and we've got lots of different mosaics of habitats and things like that, and I am now working, I'm still doing all the formal and informal learning, but I'm also working on the volunteering aspects with our biodiversity officer, so we're getting, trying to get different demographics into the forest that wouldn't normally be in the forest which is really great. So we've got we're trying to get a lot of, you know, volunteer groups for SEN and um, BAM schools and things like that. It is very like public engagement and it's very sort of, you know, it's, it's people facing, you know, you spend a lot of time with children. I would say if you don't like children, it wouldn't be for you, but it is great because you get to meet children from different backgrounds and different schools, different needs and abilities. Yeah. So what does my day, day to day look like? So I, so generally if we've got a school in, we will sort of We'll have your, your plan in advance, you get a bit of planning time and you'll have sent that to the school and then you'll be doing things like prepping resources. If you're having a fire, you might be getting ready for that. Um, you'll be getting your like bug pots ready and all things like that. And yeah, just, just delivering. We deliver from about nine till 2.30 in the afternoon and we tend to have like a fun aspect in the afternoon. I also do other things. I've helped with different events. So I've done like some family walks. I did a Halloween walk for families in the forest, which was great fun. I've done some social media stuff. And I will say the internship, I think, really gave me the skills to be able to go into, this is my dream job, I'd say. And it really gave me the skills because I got to do so many things. I got to learn about social media, how to make videos. Really, I mean, I was, I've always been okay with talking to people, but it's, it really teaches you how to talk to people on a different level and children and how to engage people. You know, I'm going to learn to drive a minibus. I've done lots of first aid courses. So the skills that it gives you has really enabled me to um, be able to do this job. And it's really nice as well because the team that I work in, I'm able to watch a lot of other people deliver stuff and I've learned a lot of skills and things like that. I think my favourite things about working with a job in the job are probably working with children. I think it shows you how, how precious childhood is. You know, we've got a big hill at the site that I work out and they often like to roll down the hill at lunchtime. And it just shows you how important childhood is. And that's the age that you want to reach people and talk about, you know, you want them to be our future forest guardians and you want to engage them from a young age you know every day is different that's what I love about it you know you're outside all the time you know we don't we do all our learning outside even in really wet weather so you know you're always outside it's you know you get to see the forest in its different um seasons you know so if you love outdoors and being in nature it is really good for that you know we do have a teaching classroom but we don't really use it we're all outside um in terms of like tips that I would give for people like wanting to work in education, I like um, Yolanda and Sam, I actually worked in Marks and Spencer's for three years making coffee. So I know how difficult it is, like they say, to get into the industry. So don't, you know, give up if you think you can't do it. Volunteering really helped me. You know, if you're looking to get into education, see if you can work, you know, go and do some work experience with scouts or girl guiding or lots of different things you know work children there's lots of like after school clubs you could work with things like that and read up on things about education 
um, you know, there's lots of kids with different needs and abilities. So I did a lot of reading on SEN and things like that. You know, I think as well, don't be put off applying if you don't think you have the skills because they're not necessarily looking for those tick points. But like, like Yolanda said, show your enthusiasm and your positivity and show that you've actually thought about it when you're applying um, and just be enthusiastic. So yeah, I think that really helped me. If anybody has any questions or things they'd like to know, please Q&A us at the end. So thank you for listening. So I'm Emma, I'm the Assistant Biodiversity Officer. I focus on grasslands and grassland management. As Yolanda said at the start, we are really well known for our forests and trees, um, but we do have a mosaic of other habitats as well. So I focus on managing grasslands using our conservation grazing programme. So I work with livestock like our sheep to um, maintain and enhance and improve our grasslands to benefit wildlife and the soil and the land in general for our future generations to come as well. To go back to the start of, of, where, I'm, of where I began, I don't know how old our audiences are, whether you're a teenager, whether you're an adult, um, so I will quickly run back to the beginning. So back in school, I was not very academic. I really, really struggled in school. Um, when I was around 12, I came across an animal sanctuary, which as these animals pictured are here, I grew up with a lot of animals. Um, so from day one, I've been in love with nature, in love with animals. And I knew from the start that that's what I, what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. The only thing was, because it's such a broad spectrum, I wasn't 100% sure of which angle I wanted to go into. Um, so again, when I got to college, everybody was talking about universities and I remember just sitting there feeling really overwhelmed thinking, oh, I don't think I'm clever enough to go to uni. I don't think I can do any of that. So my college tutor sat down with me and we had a talk and she said, you just write down what makes you happy, what you're interested in, what you're passionate about and, you know, what sparks that interest in you. I did have a look at, at universities and I decided to push myself and pushed away all those thoughts of, you know, you're not able to do it, you're not good enough, all that imposter syndrome. And I went to university to do animal behaviour and wildlife conservation. And I shocked myself and managed to get through it with a struggle. And then I decided to push myself even further with a lot of support from family and friends. Um, and I did a master's in wildlife conservation. So again, you know, a lot of it is mindset as well as gaining the skills, gaining the knowledge. It is just your sheer determination, which is going to get you further than what even you will think. So I graduated in 2018 from my master's. And again, financially, I wasn't doing very well because I just finished university. So I went back home. I moved in with mum and dad again. And I took the first job that came my way, which was becoming a karate teacher. So on a side note, I've done karate since I was about eight, eight, ten years old. Um, did it as a hobby, absolutely loved it, and then took it on as a job. Um, so here you see me pictured with my niece, um, who I also trained. And I did that for, for a full year, but that was working 12, 13 hour days, depending on what we were doing. And that was six days a week. And on top of that, I was applying for loads and loads of jobs and I got rejected left, right and centre. It was constant. So it's really disheartening and we all, we've all we all been there. We know what it's like. Um, so by the end of 2018, I decided that I needed to take a risk. I needed to just try a leap of faith and, you know, work part time. So I ended up working part time at three jobs. I worked at a pub. I trained... Uh, taught karate and I also went back working at the animal sanctuary that I mentioned that I've worked at since uh, a very young age but I'll, alongside that I also volunteered so I volunteered with the Lancashire Wildlife Trust as a, a forest school educator I volunteered with the National Wild National Trust sorry as a volunteer ranger and I also volunteered doing bat surveys and bumblebee surveys so my week in 2019 would have been working at karate eight to eight on the Monday and then I'd go and do a bat survey in the evening or in the morning and then 
on the Tuesday, it'd be at the animal sanctuary, nine till five. Wednesday, working at the forest school. And then Thursday, it would be volunteering again. Friday, it would be working at karate. And then Saturday, I'd be at the pub, but also applying for loads of jobs. Now, this really worked well for me, even though it was really tiring. But what I found then was I was still getting loads of rejection from jobs. I was being rejected because I had a lot of knowledge, but not quite all the experience. And then a direct quote from another job was that I had too much experience and too much knowledge and they didn't know what they would do with me. So I just ended up being this big slump thinking, I, I don't know where I'm going. You know, it was like a, a real limbo in my life, I suppose. Um, so I decided to broaden my horizons. I looked further afield than what I was looking at locally. And then that's how I ended up at the Heart of England Forest. So I started as a forestry intern. So everything Yolanda's mentioned with the internship, um, that's exactly what I've been through. Tree planting, getting covered in mud, out in all weathers, learning how to use a chainsaw, which I've never touched in my life, driving tractors. So, and there's a lot more training that, that's on top of that, not just with machinery and, you know, getting onto that. There's things like first aid, there's all sorts of different types of training as well as uh, survey training as well. And then after I became an intern, I became an assistant ranger and I did that for a year. And then recently in October, I became the assistant biodiversity officer where now, as you can see in the picture, I work with livestock and I also work with work alongside farmers. So we're looking at for example, uh, one of the sites, we're looking at trial and mob grazing to see what works um, for different types of habitat, different types of grassland, uh, what livestock would work best to help build over the years. Because it's a long term project, you know, obviously with nature, nothing is, you know, a sprint, it's a marathon. So it's, it's looking at the long term benefits of how what we're doing right now will work. So yeah, so that's that's mainly my role. I also, it, you know, the role is so diverse. No day is the same. One minute I can be uh, trimming some sheep's hooves. The next day I could be, you know, helping with volunteering, hedge planting and things like that. So there is a lot to the job. No day is the same. No week is the same. And that's what I love about it because it keeps you challenged and it keeps you on your toes as well. My main point um, from all of this is literally what everybody has said in terms of their top tips volunteer if you can I understand it's really hard financially in terms of volunteering if you've got family it's even harder but if even if you volunteered like once a month or once every other month that still gives you that bit of experience more for you to talk about as well um also one of the things that I did um I use the power of social media I got myself on LinkedIn and I connected with loads of people who were in industries that I found really interesting, different types of conservation roles, different types of animal roles. And I just messaged them and I just chatted to them. And the worst thing people can do is just say no, they don't have the time, which is absolutely fine. But what I found was a lot of people are really happy to give you their time. So I really, really would recommend if you're not quite sure where you want to go just have a look at what everyone else is doing have a chat with them because everybody's always really helpful and really happy to to talk and finally don't forget how important you are honestly i know it's it's the typical thing to say of don't give up and things like that but your passion your determination and your drive is another massive skill that will get you that foot in the door role, no matter what age you are, whether you're a teenager, whether you're somebody that's might be retiring and you might think, oh, you know, I, I do fancy this. There is somebody that I know that's 60 and he's gone back to university and he's doing some climate change course. So there's never, you know, the timeline isn't, it's not a step, it's a roller coaster. So please just remember how important it is for you to just keep going stay determined and not give up that's the main thing because that will get you far because I know because <laughs> I've been in the slump of thinking I'm never going to get anywhere I'm stuck and I'm here I'm actually in it and I never thought that I'd get here so you will as well
Um, but yeah, so that's me. Thank you. Just before we go over to uh, the Q&A session, there's just a couple of things that I want to mention here. So obviously, um, everybody has spoken about well, most people have spoken about various internships that they've had with the charity and I said before that we will be uh, advertising for a few more uh, in the coming months well and years as well I would just like to say though that um for those sorts of roles there is you don't need a degree in order to apply and attain those um obviously in, in some cases it may help but do not feel that that is an essential requirement for those posts and also we recognize that oh to try and get uh, for uh, training and volunteering in um financially it can, it can be a bit of a strain on you so for all of our jobs all across the charity we pay a living wage and so that is roughly at the moment it's about 20,000 a year so that means that you can get your training uh, get that work experience get all of that whilst being able to sort of be financially sound as well and that's something that we're really proud to sort of provide as a charity um, but yes yeah, so one of the questions that's been asked is how much of an advantage does getting a degree put you when trying to get employed in the industry so um, I don't know whether oh, Yolanda, Yolanda do you want to come in on that one yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I think it, um, I think it depends on the role um, you'd want to go into. Um, I know for, for example, maybe some of the more kind of um, office based, maybe biodiversity roles might require a, a degree potentially. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that. But just from chatting to a few people that are in similar roles at the charity, that is the kind of general idea I get maybe after I finish Sam you could potentially jump in on that as well um but I think for my kind of role at least it's not essential um to have a degree um you can you know if you have a degree like great and and particularly if you've done a kind of degree in a related subject fantastic because you've probably learned a lot of very like theoretical and, and kind of academic knowledge that would really benefit working in this role um but I mean, I had, I do have a degree, but my degree is very, it's not related, it's in English, it's a very kind of different subject. Um, and I'm sure I do use some of the skills that I learned from my degree, but majoritively, a lot of the skills and the training that's relevant to my role now, I learn on the internship. Um, and you don't need a degree to get that internship. Um, essentially, you just need the, the kind of passion and um, maybe some baseline voluntary experience. Um, but yeah, you, you don't need a degree to get on the internship. So um, yeah, I hope that answers that. Yeah, I'd, I'd second what Yolanda said there. For, for a role like mine, I'd say, yeah, you, you probably need to need one because of uh, the analytical, statistical, um, all the survey, um, actually planning that outside of things. Um, QGIS is usually taught at universities. So that's another thing you pick up. Uh, so it tends to be helpful for maybe my uh, role but certainly in the forestry team there's some people which have come through uh, as apprentices where they've just been um doing it as part of their, their college course uh part-time doing the college um work in college uh, and then part-time um doing the work uh, in the forest practical uh, side of stuff um or they uh, came through some other um uh side of the thing on the forestry uh, and can you make a living out of a career in the environment and how do you manage when volunteering for so long if you're not earning money so yeah it's probably uh it can be quite difficult but um, um i suppose if you've got that that job going your main job um there's plenty of ways to volunteer um say there's weekend volunteering things um say if you work Four days in the week and one day at the weekend quite a lot of volunteering things are in the week so you could you could have one day um there every week or, or even if it was once a month um there are plenty of things that really have to be done at night for example so like i was saying about the bat surveys um and after you brought up the experience there you can easily get paid for it so it's uh, it's slowly progressing into the role itself uh, once that starts to happen i'm um, just to add on to the end of that as well um just kind of focusing on the can you make a living part of that question um so I'm, I'm kind of happy to say that I probably work in one of the like lower paid kind of environmental jobs um obviously you can actually get paid quite a lot in an environmental job um high, the higher up the ladder you go especially if you're working in consulting or something like that you potentially can get paid quite a lot so it depends what you kind of want to move into um but if you 
the more kind of practical side sim similar to what I do um yes it is slightly lower paid um but you know I, I mean I still make a living from it I, I'm aware that it's um you know if I maybe wanted kind of more luxuries in life then I you know I wouldn't be able to afford potentially like a nice holiday to Jamaica once a year but um it kind of depends I guess what you want from life but you definitely can make a living um from from kind of my salary um and it just kind of depends what depends what you want but even in my role now if you decide you know as you get older and, and you might want a bit more money or whatever there are kind of ways you can go you can get into forest management eventually which is you know well paid um so yeah really it depends but um I would say yeah you definitely can make a living it, it just kind of it yeah depends how much money you want from life really um and that might determine which role you want to go into fabulous so um next question is for ellie um so do you have any practical teaching experience for a role in the learning and skills team or do you need to have practical learning you know, that, that's a really good question actually no i don't actually um the only thing i could say is i know a lot of teachers in my family so i have a bit of you know i have good people's torture for advice but no i don't have any skills and a lot of actually what i've learned is just through watching other members of the team deliver and watching other teachers deliver so in my internship there was a big um that was a lot of what i did I, I did a lot of observations and watching and seeing different techniques and things like that um we do have a outdoor teacher in our team but the two other members of staff are not teachers either and i think also you know that wasn't a requirement of my role experience was a requirement so i'd got obviously my girl guiding and my experience working in their young offenders but no i don't have any teaching experience so i think it is definitely something you can learn and you can observe and get tips from. Um, thank you. And then also for you, Ellie, um, I've got a question. So what would be an example of teaching English in a sort of nature school environment? Um, English, that is a good one. So we did one recently where we did um, stories. We did like fairy tales, we did it with reception and we got them to basically tell us the story using freeze frames in the forage, forest sorry forage forest freeze frames so they had to do different um, freeze frames of different chapters of different parts of the book and they get to make like natural pictures out of sticks and leaves of things that happen in the book so you can almost do like a natural comic book things like that get them to act things out we do a lot of acting a lot of singing things like that pin things to the trees so it's all very different dependent on what you're doing fab so next one is probably more for sam um but what sort of organizations should i approach approach to carry out that and other surveys um so um i, I started off at um, a local um consultancy which was part of a wildlife trust and uh, actually if you look at the wildlife trust a lot of them have this where um, they'll have a, a small consultancy on the side um, which helps bring funds in to them fund the habitat management work um, and, and they're always happy to uh, have people along and train them, um, certainly for all the ones I know. Um, and there's plenty of other um, uh, consultants uh, around, which, again, would be would be happy to, to have someone along and train. Um, a lot of them are either um, a lot of them tend to be local back group um, volunteers as well, or, or they run local back groups. So uh, it's not just the job side of thought for them. They're, they're very, very happy to train people up uh, on the whole. Um, yeah, yeah, generally just look around um, and that that goes not just for, for bats, but um, so, for example, thinking locally, um, Warwickshire, the county council there, they have, um, have what's called the Habitat Biodiversity Audit. They're always doing vegetation surveys there. Again, they're very, very enthusiastic about that. They're more than happy to have people come along and, and help, I imagine. And that's the same up and down the country, I imagine. Um, thank you. Super, thank you, Sam. So the next question, uh, which I will probably pick up on, um, is are there any plans to increase uh, weekend volunteering sessions? So at the moment, we tend to run about two Saturday volunteering sessions um, a month, so that's every other week. Um, but currently what we're doing, we are looking to increase uh, that frequency of weekend volunteering to potentially also include some Sundays too. Um, we're also thinking about potentially trialing some evening volunteering sessions, obviously during the summer, because that's when 
it will be daylight hours. Um, but so in terms of that respect, I would recommend volunteering um, if you haven't already signing up to our volunteer e-newsletter. It comes out um, every fortnight and it tells you about all the things, all the volunteering that's going on across the forest um, over the over a two week period. Um, so that's for that one. And then this is for everybody or for anybody to jump into. Um, would you say that most of the roles in the organization require environmental experience or sort of education in that field? Um, as somebody late in their working life, I have lots of skills gained in people and operational management, but none from an environmental role. In terms of the role I do, um, it is quite specific in the training that you need. So if you were to come in straight and you wanted just to bypass the kind of internship side and you wanted to come straight in as an assistant ranger, um, you do need, um, in order just to get a job, um, kind of based on training, which will be a chainsaw um, ticket. Um, and also I think they ask for tractor driving as well, potentially, um, but definitely the chainsaw ticket. So um it would require it's not necessarily kind of an a, you know environmental field but just that very specific training is something that they do ask for um as a kind of standard um but that is something that you if you wanted to come in from an internship um through the internship you would get that on the internship so um in terms of the internship you don't need um you don't need kind of a background in an environment related job um just the passion and the enthusiasm to show that you're willing to learn that's something we actually really ask for particularly in the forestry internship um they actually quite like um people applying who are looking for a career change um and and yeah they like to know that the internship is is kind of a really important thing to someone who is looking for that um opportunity to change careers so as long as you could like demonstrate that in the application or something like that um then you could you know you are still definitely within a chance of have of getting onto the internship um so yeah yeah hope that answers that for you yeah also to add on to that yeah um for some jobs, yes, you do require uh, that past experience, but I think it's also demonstrating that you are really keen about the role and showing that through your past experience, you, you can transfer over those skills to this other job that you'd like to apply for as well. So I wouldn't necessarily say that because you don't have a, a degree or you don't have specific things necessarily that you should completely discount um, any jobs that you're looking at. I mean, it's it's always worth a shot, I'd say. And particularly, I'd say that the charity is quite open-minded uh, with these sorts of things. Do any of you have any tips for working effectively for long hours, long-term? Like in the forestry internship, how would you describe sort of the intensity with the demands or the requirements of the job? No, um, I was going to say in terms of the intensity of it, I suppose it, it depends on you as an individual, like your fitness level, because um, every, everybody's different. You know, some people might get exhausted quite quickly. Others might be all right. But, even, you know, I'm quite fit myself. Um, and even especially in the tree planting season, when it's been raining all day, you're covered in mud, it's freezing. You know, everyone's going to have those days of being like, oh, like. It can it can get really difficult and I, I won't dismiss that and say it is a breeze because you know it's not all the time um but I suppose in terms of the intensity um I wouldn't I suppose it's, it's hard for me to say because I've come from quite intense jobs myself so in terms of my personal past experiences with intense jobs it's not as intense as what I've previously had um but in terms of, I'd say the most intense part for me personally, I don't know if Yolanda will agree with this, but would be sort of like the chainsawing jobs because that is one, physically demanding, but two, it's mentally demanding as well. Um, but also it's not intense every day. You know, you're not going to be consistently on chainsaws. You know, you might do an, a morning of chainsawing or a couple of days of chainsawing. And then you might have another day of doing path checks where you are literally going for a walk and checking that, the, that everything's safe, 
And that is a really lovely way to spend a day. Like there's a lot of the time, you know, we do have those intense days, but there's a lot of the time where you can be doing your job and you, you have to pinch yourself because you're like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm getting paid for this. It's, it's a really lovely mix. So I wouldn't say that the job is ridiculously intense because it, it has a nice balance to it as well. I don't know if Yolanda's um, got more to add, um, but that's my take on it. Yeah, not really, to be honest, like I thought, I think I was going to say everything you said. Um, the only thing I would add on is that, um, at least for the Heart of England Forest, as a charity, um, they are really good at understanding that it's a very physically demanding job and like giving time for people to rest when they need to. Um, so I've actually got sciatica and my back can flare up from time to time and be quite painful. Um, and, you know, um, as a charity, if I come in and I say, oh, look, you know, my back's really sore today. I don't think I'm going to be able to chainsaw all day. They're so accommodating and, they're, you know, there's never any kind of like, oh, you know, this is your job. You have to keep going. It's very much a, OK, take a couple of days to do a less intense task um other people will do that job and then join in again when you're feeling up to it um and yeah so at least for our charity I can say that everyone is very understanding for it being a demanding and physically demanding job um and there is no kind of like blame culture for needing to take some time to rest if you need to thank you you two and um second to last question and this is a again for you for you guys um so with the assistant forest ranger role vacancy uh, are you able to do your chainsaw training as part of the role as in would it be funded at that level obviously with the internships that that comes as part of it but if you're coming straight in as the assistant forest ranger do you know if that would be funded as part of it um so from my understanding no if you were gonna um as kind of as savage as it sounds you probably wouldn't if you didn't have a chainsaw ticket you probably wouldn't get to an interview as an assistant rate if you're going straight for an assistant ranger job um if you didn't have a chainsaw ticket you probably wouldn't get an interview unfortunately that is a, a kind of at least in our charity that's that's like the a very essential requirement to come straight in as an assistant ranger um to have that chainsaw ticket so um, it's different with the internship, the internship, your ticket is all funded as part of the internship and all the PP that goes with that is provided as well. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, if you were to come in as an assistant ranger or wanted to come straight in as assistant ranger, you would have to have that ticket already. Um, it is worth adding. I, uh, yes, for, for these sorts of roles, it is uh, good to have those things, but do still uh, put in an application for, for that job because if you think you've got other skills that might shine through obviously to have that ticket would be really really good and obviously the the extra interview experience is really good but um don't necessarily completely discount something because of that so that has come uh, brought us to the end of this session thank you so much everybody for coming along and listening to uh what my colleagues have had to say i hope you have found it really interesting and informative and potentially quite inspiring i know i have been on i really work in the sector and yeah thank you to you guys for all of your hard work with preparing your presentations and for being really just fab this evening thank you so much for everything